Hi everyone, my name is Grant Kastner. I'm Extemporary's Community Manager, and we're back with another blog breakdown. Today we're gonna to dissect our most recent post in the vocabulary blog series, that on explicit vocabulary teaching. What do you say we break it down? Within this blog on explicit vocabulary teaching, we're gonna come across a few things. First of all, what is explicit vocabulary? What does it mean? And how does that impact uh, our classroom teaching? Secondly, what words do we teach, right? We're looking at vocabulary, what we need to know, what words do we teach? We'll talk about that. Again, how do we teach these words? How do we know what styles to use? What is best for maybe a noun or an adjective, or maybe things that can be categorized versus things that can't be categorized? We'll look at some details on that. Uh, and then continuing problem vocabulary, which is an interesting topic of the article that I looked at in the blog. We'll talk about that. Um, and then some exposure, some facts on exposure and talking about repetition, right? Getting kids exposure is how much input that they have to that vocabulary and then repetition, more so on the output side of how much do they need to produce these words and use them over and over in meaningful context in order for them to acquire this vocabulary. Finally, then we'll talk about advice on hosting some of these vocabulary practices and assessments on the extemporary platform. All right, then let's talk about explicit vocabulary. What does it mean? What is explicit vocabulary? Well, what it is, it means that we're putting vocabulary front and center of our lessons, as opposed to implicit vocabulary teaching, which is on the lines of having students sort of determine the words or find the words within the text and, and determine what they mean based on reading something or listening to something. You might give them a source, uh, an article or a video and say, hey, you know, try to figure out what these words mean based on what you see. Right? It's more um, you know, sort of inference-based. Whereas expo to say, here, I'm gonna give you the words and then we're gonna work with them to see what they mean and how we can use them. It's important to note though that when you talk about explicit vocabulary teaching versus implicit vocabulary teaching, it's not black and white to say one is better and you know this one is good and this one is bad. And with students, there's gonna be one of the, things, the quotes that I really liked in the article that I referenced um, is that there's, it's a spectrum, right? It's not it's not a dichotomy where one you know students are fully on one side and students are fully on another side, whether it's explicit or implicit. Some might prefer explicit, some might pr prefer implicit, but there's going to be a large bunch that are going to be somewhere in the middle. Right? They say, well, some, sometimes explicit works for me, sometimes implicit works for me. And it's important to consider that when we're teaching, uh, regardless of whether we're teaching with explicit vocabulary or implicit vocabulary. The final thing that I'll highlight when talking about explicit vocabulary is that even though it might sound like you're spoon feeding them words, no, it, it should be meaning based, right? So regardless of how you're teaching your vocabulary, teaching should be meaning based. There should be a interpretation of meaning if it's input based or creation of meaning if it's output based. It's not just reciting off single words and isolating them. Students are producing or interpreting something with meaning in mind. Now that we've defined what explicit vocabulary is, now we can talk about selecting unit vocabulary, choosing the words we want to teach. There are three things that I want to talk about in this specific section. First is that they are student-centered. The words we pick are student-centered. If we have a unit, whether it's hobbies or food or entertainment, social media, anything like that, we want to think about what are the words that our students want to know or the words that they feel they need to know for this particular unit you know if it's part of hobbies well not everybody might like playing basketball or roller skating or knitting it needs to be what do the students want to say what are, what are their hobbies right make it student-centered and then the second one is task-based assessment right if you look at it from a backwards design approach you might say okay well what what's my end goal what do i want my students to do with this language if it's a unit on hobbies you might say well i want them to be able to talk about a hobby that they have and why they have that hobby and maybe convince someone to go do the hobby with them at a certain time, right? That could be a task. Um, and then, so you think about, okay, well, we have the assessment. What, what is the assessment for this unit? But then you think about that, that type of assessment. Well, what vocabulary do the students need to complete that assessment, to do that task? And with, alongside the vocabulary, the grammar as well, it's another story, but grammar is still needed too. Um, and so when you think about that, you say, okay, this is the vocabulary that they need. This is the grammar that they need for this assessment. Now I'm gonna front load those, I can teach those them, teach that to the students prior. And then once that you've, they've had sufficient repetition and uh, exposure to that language and they've acquired it, and then over time, they can finally use that language in the final assessment, right? So you, you, you plan ahead, you say, what is my task? What language do I need? And you use that and you get the exposure and repetition for, to prepare the students for that assessment. And finally, uh, one of the topics that the author Young Davy brought up was problem vocabulary. I thought this was really interesting when it comes to picking vocabulary. Oftentimes in a language, say in, in English, we have words like say versus tell. Spanish has words like por versus para. Chinese has words like so versus jiang. They both mean to say. Um, and talking about these problem vocabulary, words and pairs of words that might cause confusion for certain students. Well, when you take those words, you can really help 
and you talk about them. You can help build student aware awareness of the language and you know, knowing, okay, when do I use this word? When is this word part of an idiom? Or when is this word you know, just a figure of speech? Something like that. And that's, that's really appropriate for helping, like I said, to build their awareness um, and to get them more comfortable with using maybe those tricky words um, that you have in the target language. Before we wrap up and we look at some examples on extemporary of how you can practice explicit vocabulary, I wanted to just talk for a second about exposure with vocabulary. The whole idea behind Belinda Young Davies' piece on explosive vocabulary is that students need repetition and exposure. And with this approach, it's about recycling vocabulary many, many, many times. There's, you know, it's a debate of how many times a student needs to see a vocabulary word or see a term or phrase over a certain amount of time before they acquire it. But the idea is it needs to happen a lot. Right? We know as language teachers that students cannot just see a word one time and then a week later they're going to have it. They need to see it multiple times. So for us, it's about creating scenarios, whether they're sorting those words, they're categorizing them, they're using them in a response, they're interpreting them, finding different scenarios and situations and activities where students can use these words with meaning in mind, you expose to them and then slowly acquire them over time in order to complete, whether it's a pedagogical task or a target task that you redesigned earlier. For our last part of this blog breakdown, let's look at a few examples on the extemporary platform. So one of the first things that I like to do when it comes to exposure and repetition and using explicit vocabulary and focusing on certain words is oral reading. So something I talk about a lot in previous blogs and webinars and even in trainings that I do, getting students to just read a text out loud. They can simply click, record, read the text, um, and then submit it, right? It's really good. It's really uh, helps them easily refresh words that they've seen before, see them over and over, and you can do, you know, uh, Modify these readings however you want them to be, change them to dialogues or question and answers or just straight paragraphs. That's one really helpful way. Uh, another example that I like to do is a simple dictation. And uh, Belinda Young David, the author of the study, as I've mentioned, she talks about dictations a lot. And so for mine, this is one where they simply play the audio file, they type out what they hear in the target language, and then they'll put a little number next to each sentence to or organize them into a logical paragraph. So the dialogue, the audio is originally out of order, but uh, it's comprehensive, right? So it's meaning-based, and so they have to listen to the sentences, type out the sentence, put the number next to how they think that should go if it was a logical paragraph, uh, and that shows their comprehension. You know, David, the author of the study, she talks about she talks about paraphrasing dictation. She talks about um, taking a dictation and telling it to someone else. She talks about continuing a dictation. It's not just typing out what they hear. There's all sorts of different strategies that you, you can use dictations for. Um, so I thought that was really helpful. And then one final example that I like is I like to make these little graphics that you see here on the left, have some, have some information and then ask questions about it, ask a question in the target language and have students pick the target, the correct answer given what they see um, in the picture. Or you can have them talk about what they see in the picture in an open-ended response. All sorts of really valuable ways that you can get repetition and more exposure to the target language um, using extemporary and via explicit vocabulary teaching. Thank you all for tuning into this most recent blog breakdown on explicit vocabulary. If you're interested in more about vocabulary, we're going to have a webinar on January 27th, 2022 at 4 p.m. Central Time with Mr. Joe Barkoff of Washington University in St. Louis. Check out the link below in the YouTube description for the Zoom registration. Click there to sign up and we'll see you there. Bye.